This video series has detailed an extensive list of transitional forms or successive evolutionary stages, essentially all the way from mere microbes to men over the course of nearly four billion years. In other words, But there are many people who object to these lessons, and not just because they don't even want to know about any of this and they don't want anybody else to know about it either, but because they seem to object to their own physical form, sometimes preferring to pretend that they don't have a physical basis at all. We are a part of nature, not apart from it, but there are some who insist that they are somehow separate from the physical world, this zoo, this prison, this reality, whatever you want to call it. And some people complain that those of us who understand the science in this series must necessarily think that humans are not beings, but that we are just animals, as if we are no more than We're just a bag of chemicals, as the science denialists put it. I know a few experts in various aspects of evolutionary study, and only a few of them believe that we have a soul or anything like that, but I've never met anyone who believes that we are only the sum of our parts. Importantly, regardless whatever else anyone believes we are or might be beyond that, there is no dispute of the fact that we are animals and that our bodies really are a chemical construct. Whether you think we are just that or not, we definitely are at least that. And we can prove that is the truth and we should accept demonstrable truth, right? I am religiously obligated to believe it if it's true. I'm glad to hear that because some people refuse to accept reality, or they're confused about the concept of starting with a base template and modifying that to make something new out of it. For example... It's not a motorcycle, baby, it's a chopper. No. You can modify a bike into a chopper, but that chopper will still be a motorcycle. And likewise, we never stopped being animals when we became human, and you can't deny that every human body is made of material substance. I mean unless you want to reject material reality outright, which some people do, even though that is effectively madness. We talk specifically about physical changes in our skull, our pelvis, our pores, and our feet, with the reduction of body hair and muscle mass, as well as diminution of the jaw and reduction of our teeth, balanced against encephalization, or the unprecedented growth of the human brain, with all these changes being documented both in the fossil record and in the genome. These were physical changes affecting even our natal development as well as our social intellectual enhancement and not just collectively learning how to make tools and weapons as well as how to cook our food. We also talked about a number of structural changes in the morphology of our mouth and throat in concert with genetic changes in our brains enabling us to make, articulate, coordinate, associate and comprehend an intricate repertoire of meaningful sounds showing how the evolution of language aided the development of higher order thinking skills which were once banned in the state of Texas by people who were afraid that students might learn forbidden knowledge. In this episode, we will continue to explore the humanization of the ape. Not just the physical traits that define us as human, I think we've covered that. And now we're going to talk about what made us emotionally, intellectually, and culturally people. A common question asked at this point, which seems late in the game given all we've seen already, is where does consciousness come from? And the reason we're just talking about that now is that I've known people who believe that dogs and horses, apes and elephants, parrots, dolphins, and everything besides people are not conscious like only we are, and therefore they don't really feel pain or have fear. They're just reacting as if they do because they're only pre-programmed machines that don't really know or feel anything. And the way it was put to me was, it's just a dumb animal, it don't feel nothing. The very notion of an animal being dumb and thus not knowing pain or terror even while it is being harvested alive is, I think, a lie that those people have to tell themselves in order to excuse their inhuman cruelty against all other animals. You see, some people think that the network of 86 billion neurons in our brains could never give us consciousness because they're just chemicals producing electrical impulses. And since none of these cells on their own alone can possess consciousness unto itself, then no amount of them together can be collectively conscious. Just like the copper and silicone in your cell phone separately don't have the powers of computation and potentially comprehension that a computer does, even though a computer is only a combination of material components that don't have those abilities individually either. 
Now, some philosophers pontificate that we either have consciousness or we don't, that it's all or nothing. As if you get up to a certain number of neurons into the brain before a light suddenly switches on to become conscious. But to my experience, biologists, and especially zoologists, tend to see this very differently. They see that every individual cell, and indeed every biochemical process, has some fundamental awareness of its condition. And some philosophize that human conscious cannot be an emergent property of our evolutionary advancement. Why? Because just like creationists accept only microevolution but not macro, some philosophers only accept what they call soft or weak emergence and not hard emergence, leading to what they call the hard problem which honestly sounds to me like no more than special pleading, especially since the arguments for it include unrealistic special expectations. So how could consciousness emerge via evolution? Literally the same way that vision emerged. Imagine an organism with a photoreceptive cell or a photosensitive cell. How sensitive is it? Maybe it only detect, barely detects any brightness at all. It can only tell light from dark, what we would certainly call legally blind if we were talking about a human with that condition. But as this organism is subtly adjusted and modified over many generations of natural selection, with some of those art adjustments being saved as useful improvement, then it gradually sees more and better and hones its focus for a better perspective and recognition of finer details, which is exactly the same way that consciousness develops too. At what point would we say that such an organism is suddenly no longer blind and now it can see? We can't point to the moment that that change happens, but only because it's not a moment. It's not sudden and it's not that you're either sighted or blind. At every point it has some degree of sight, or at least it has some perception of itself and its surroundings. And that is the essence of what consciousness is. Now, the only difference is whether we are figuratively or literally opening our eyes. Our awareness and perception of ourselves and our immediate environment can be just as slowly emergent yet primitively barely present as these advancing improvements in vision. Look into the eyes of any other mammal and you should be able to see their consciousness reflected back at you. It, this is especially easy in warm-blooded animals. Maybe they're not as conscious of some things as you are, but you can't say that they're not aware of anything or that they're not thinking at all. I'm sure we've all seen dogs acting out in their sleep, proving that they're dreaming. So dreams are not uniquely human, and even though we are unconscious when we dream, we still have to possess a high degree of consciousness to enable dreaming. And we know that dogs and other organisms try and sometimes succeed in figuring things out, and they don't need eyes or even a brain. Here we see a slime mold finding its way through a maze. And once this living blob has found the most efficient path, it signals the rest of its amorphous mass to follow suit. And it does this without any brain cells at all. Unless it counts as a brain cell itself, because this unicellular glob of goo, thus far inexplicably, demonstrates some capacity for reason. So despite what some philosophers say, it is not such a hard problem to understand how higher human consciousness could emerge. It's, it's not like you have to have X number of neurons before you suddenly awaken into being no longer unconscious because our evolutionary ancestors were not unconscious either. Every organism has chemical signals giving it some minuscule awareness, even when it's not a neuron and doesn't have any neurons. For another example, these paramecia don't have any sensory organs or brain cells because they, like the slime mold, are only single-celled themselves. Yet they detect the chemical evidence of the engulfing amoeba, and this induces a panic response, an attempt at self-preservation, which qualifies as a faint glimmer of consciousness at perhaps its least detectable level. Thus it turns out that every individual brain cell does have its own consciousness, however slight that may be. Obviously, the more sensory systems you have and the more advanced your neural network becomes to interpret these things, the more aware you can be and consequently the more conscious you are. The point is that it's not like humans are alone are cognizant and that all other animals are not. And some people complain that if we are just animals ourselves, that we should act like animals, as if that means that we should run amok victimizing and vandalizing everyone just for fun, as if that would be fun. I guess that depends on your individual defect. Yet, despite the apparent paradox of our being the most unnecessarily, sadistically cruel and ironically inhumane species on the planet, we are also among the most capable of caring. This too is a result of our evolution. 
When I was a little boy, one of my favorite movies was One Million Years B.C. with Raquel Welch, even though I always knew how dumb that movie was, because there were so few movies that showed dinosaurs when I was a kid, and even fewer that showed bunny fur bikinis. The movie illustrated a lot of misconceptions about pre the prehistoric world, which we saw repeated again in the movie Caveman with Ringo Starr. In both films, we have cruel, selfish, and violent people who act like unevolved apes, being contrasted with a more civilized, peaceful, and productive, caring community of generous people who've learned how to share. Did you notice that in both of these movies, the more advanced race are mostly blondes? We'll talk more about that little bit of subtle propaganda at another time. Otherwise, these films really do illustrate an important distinction between humans and the other apes. Behavioral biologists and psychologists have conducted a series of experiments comparing behaviors of humans and other apes and how individuals in either set interact with their own groups in an attempt to identify antisocial versus prosocial behavior. In summary, these collective studies showed that while chimpanzees, for example, can be generous and cooperative and even has a sense of fairness and even some comprehension of another's perspective, they do not have an adequate understanding of the beliefs and desires of others. For example, they may be perfectly willing to hand you something if you ask for it, but they wouldn't give it to you otherwise, even if they can see that you need it, because they're really not that helpful. They will cooperate and invite cooperation when they need something, and they will share labor as well as food, but not as much as humans do, because they don't feel the level of empathy that we do. They're not able to put themselves into someone else's shoes to see things from another's perspective, which is a problem I have too, frankly. While the other apes certainly do show concern and sympathy for others, they are more selfish than we. Humans are motivated to help other people, even other species, out of concern for their welfare. Other animals do this too, but not to the degree that we do. It's just a matter of proportion, but in general, chimpanzees are often more concerned with taking care of their own needs and ignoring anyone else's, whereas human children, even as young as 18 months old, will try to comfort adults who seem to be distressed. And for this trait to occur in such young children indicates that it goes far back into our evolution, likely emerging relatively soon after our split from the ancestry with chimpanzees. It is this capacity for empathy, and not our intelligence, that gave us the edge over the other apes. This is what distinguishes humans among other, older animals. Despite all our unspeakable criminality, cruelty, prejudicial hatred, and all of that, our species can also go the other way, with a deep concern for others, which explains our willingness to get involved selflessly, to intercede on another's behalf, even when that comes at significant risk or cost to ourselves. Predators pick off the slow and the weak. But that's hard to do when everyone's looking out for everyone else. It's happened a few times in other species that those who lack the necessary strength by themselves found strength in numbers. In our species, that behavior was recurrent, resulting in a number of memorable slogans like, all for one and one for all. You mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. United we stand and stand together. Many other animals could take us down one on one, but together we could overcome anything. In a strange sense, it was our weakness that made us stronger. Because without fangs or claws or brute strength, the one thing we could depend on was each other to protect us and provide for us. And that requires that you be ready to risk your own life coming to my aid as I must be to defend you too. Because if you're in trouble and others rally around it and your moment of need, but I ran away, my standing in the community would be nullified such that I may as well keep on running and never come back because I would never be welcome or trusted. Deviant aberrations occur all the time and in every population. That's why we have to make and enforce laws. But psychopaths with underdeveloped prefrontal lobes or with dysfunctional mirror neurons or who are otherwise stingy, apathetic, and cruel tend to be eliminated from the gene pool either by being banished, imprisoned, or killed. Whereas those who are kind and fair, supportive, and admirably industrious tend to earn community trust. They and their children are more likely to prosper and proliferate and eventually become the dominant demographic simply as a matter of population mechanics. 
So it was that those who stood in defense of their kinsmen or who toiled alongside them were respected, lauded, and loved, and their children inherited that celebrated genetic inclination over and over again, generation after generation, typically eliminating and replacing lazy, selfish cowards to become the standard that represents what it means to be human. The same goes for those who work for a common goal of protection, preservation, or provision to make things better than they were, however they can. Using a system of trade, we can specialize in our own various talents on our own, and what we can accomplish working together is literally monumental. This is what our cultural identity is based on, collective efforts of cooperative community. Thus, we have a strong selective pressure to feel mutual compassion for our family, friends, and fellows. That's why most people now are psychologically healthy enough that they feel good when they help someone and guilty when we wrong someone. That behavior has become inherent in our evolutionary condition. That's how our morality evolved through natural, sexual, and in this case, social selection through the humanizing effect of society. I'm not just talking about any one society compared to any other either, but all of them collectively. Human society. Uh, any political system temporarily controlled by some unjust despot or an, an oppressive regime still has to manipulate the masses through propaganda because every human society, all of them, understand and can objectively confirm that the right thing to do is to preserve the health and happiness of others because, uh, besides ourselves. And we all agree that to cause unnecessary harm or suffering or even to merely allow it through inaction is effectively evil. Just as when tetrapods return to the sea and are forced to adapt to that environment, getting webbed feet and that sort of thing, we were forced to adapt our behavior to function in community. Thus, our morality is an inevitable result of our evolution as a social species. It wasn't an arbitrary mandate decreed by some subjective authority commanding us to behave, because even without that, we know that this is the only conduct that works in this symbiotic relationship we created. A society that is no longer just a, a hierarchy, but has become a community upon which we depend entirely and which in turn depends on us interacting productively. And this necessitates that we adapt fellowship and camaraderie to beget civility. In other words, our continued cooperative cohabitation demands humanity. Mm -hmm.